Oh, no, g'day, buddy. Morning. It's JD. You're barebacking it today without the glasses collar. Mate, contacts the first time. We'll see how we go. Oh, you got contacts. I did on the weekend. You're a bloody new man. I am. Ruth will think she's bloody cheating on you <laughs> with you. <laughs> boys, boys, mate, we've got a bit of a – we're venturing into a new – Frontier of mining news today. It's going. We're into petroleum news, you'd say. <laughs> petroleum news, yeah. Petroleum, energy. oil, and gas, energy. energy. Yeah, keeping the world alive when it's relevant, Matty. Oh, re- they're all resources, aren't they? Oil and gas, mining, minerals, minerals, resources, <laughs> chemicals, chemicals. Yeah, lithium's a chemical. Yeah. So this come about after having this was on the back of the bloody event. Where, by the way, we were selling T-shirts. If you want one of those bloody – if you want to look like JD, you get bloody – head on to the – follow the links in the show notes to the Shopify link. Look at the you, strapping mate, model you get shining a, off the you shirts. You get a bloody uh, – you get a shirt that JD's on, got on. Not like – not one of these, but we will explain these in a minute. We might be able to put and these on the website too. Bloody JD might um, chuck in a free pack of contact lenses as well if you like <laughs> So just chuck it in the uh, – My treat. Yeah. <laughs> Discount code JD, contact lenses, you get a free set. Head to the Shopify link, grab a shirt. Bloody boys. So at the at the <laughs> event, talking to a, an absolute GC, Thompson, mm. he's a bit of an oil and gas guru, and he said you got to cover the Woodside Santos merger talks next week. I'm like, well, I know nothing about that. Trav, you got a, you're a bit up. A little bit up the curve on oil and gas. You can talk the lingo. Oh, ba- barely, mate. I oh, um, yeah. Anyway, couple, couple spreadsheet numbers. JD. That's why we had Thompson on, mate, to explain it to so us. So we brought the big fella in. Yep. So we thought the Santos Woodside was, I guess, the the catalyst for the talk. But we thought we'd uh, give you get a good bit of lay of the land about the east coast, west coast, gas market, and all dynamics in Australia. Yep. Um, a few of the bloody key players. What assets? in the country are under this Santos Woodside portfolio, what this merger is going to look like if it happens. Will, um, will the deal happen? Will the deal happen? Yeah. And just a bit of good bloody chit-chat about the whole oil and gas landscape. And, it was bloody good. And Matty couldn't wait to talk about mining companies in the process, so it only takes him like – I linked it back to Chris and Gina pretty <laughs> two, easily. Two, two minutes to talk about, yeah, Minres and, and Hancock's interest. In, I'm like, um, can you convert in that into market. tons for me? Yeah. Yeah, I yeah, know so, it was bloody good. I Send suspect it. we'll be talking more and more about um, gas. I mean, there are some interesting gas, oil and gas companies on the um, on the ASX, and, and a lot of them have a, a bit of a WA bias, which is where we are, obviously. So, mm. um, mate, I, I got a lot out of the chat. and uh, Me too. I was a bit surprised because we rocked up in the morning, JD and I, and Matty's like, yeah, no, I've got a guy coming in in, uh, in 30 minutes. And we're just like, oh, okay. Oh, sweet. You don't even have to research. <laughs> Pleasure doing business with you. Right, now, here we go. Let's get into it. Now, we might have to explain these shirts that Trav and I have got on. Mate, talk about, no you reckon mate. fucking Hooteroo's hats were hot property. This is going to take it to a new level. I'll tell you what you need to explain more Shh. than the shirt, Matty, <laughs> is your bloody bare chest. I can see the effect of your laser treatment. You've got no hair on your chest anymore. Yeah, I've got some vouchers. Vow- I've still got five vouchers to rip through. <laughs> I'm a new man. You used to be all curly, the bloody Lebanese in me. Uh, but anyways, another another bloke that could possibly – Oh, I don't think this guy's had laser treatment yet, but he doesn't need. Oh, he it just he's... actually he just waxes it. He waxes it himself, like just grabs it. Bare and hands, bare hand waxing. And who is that man? Another the man on this shirt. Now we'll just zoom in. Have a look at that. Now that looks to me like Ryan O'Sullivan. <laughs> We've got Ryan O'Sullivan party shirts. <laughs> Wow, yeah, bloody good. Jeez, bloody feel good too. Good for a good for a boat party or something, these ones. Wicked summer shirts. I'm going to wear mine um, Christmas Day, I think. This is my Christmas shirt sort of. Mm, I love it. I think this might – it is – I cannot tell you. It's pretty much as comfortable as not having a shirt on at all. So, <laughs> mate, obviously, look, the K-drill thing started out as like, you know, RC drilling experts and everything and it was a bit oh, – we were probably pigeonholing them a bit at the start when we started doing ads, but like, look, the business and like their capabilities since we've started dealing with them has just fucking gone absolutely gangbusters. Like mm. the diamond drilling is one small component of it as well, but like Ryan's bare hand drilling, mm. we've now into um, 
like beautician treatments with laser his bare treatment. hand waxing. Yeah. Like I think and he'd shoot lasers from his bare hands. And they're hosting hosting their own arm wrestling competitions between him and Swallow. We talk a uh, bit about offshore oil and gas drilling in, in this one, Matty. So I think we could um, I wouldn't put it out of the would, question. I wouldn't put it out of the question for Rhino to extract oil out of the deep sea. With, oh, with his bare hands. Well, I reckon if we can get K drill over to the um, smack over, start drilling some 5K holes, like if you're going to get some Australian expertise that can punch a deep hole in uh, manually or mechanically, uh, mate, and over there, especially it gets pretty hot over there, doesn't it? Does it? Is it Atacama? In summer, it'd be bloody hot. Yeah. I don't think it's... I don't think smack it's, over. Smack over? Is it's, that in, it's in Arkansas in America. Oh, that's not that hot, is it? <laughs> oh, no, I'm thinking of the ones in Nevada. That gets bloody hot. That can get hot out there, yeah. That's where you'd need a bare chest. So I'd re- recommend you get a... Sacra Pass, I think a, you're talking about. Yeah, get... Yeah. Get a Rhino Sullivan bloody chest wax before you head over just to, you know, bloody make but if, yourself comfortable. But if Rhino starts... Giving everyone a chest wax. What are you going to do with your vouchers? Oh, oh, I might have to try it. That's a bloody bit of a conundrum I'm in. Yeah. Do you reckon we can get some bloody reflective tape on these shirts and, like, make it a new form of drilling PPE? <laughs> have a look at it. Oh, bloody beautiful. It's right. So if you're looking for deep oil sedimentary drilling. Um, K-drill. <laughs> with, an Austra- <laughs> with an Australian bloody cowgooly bread bloody company feel behind it <laughs> bloody k drill but look if um until the rigs get chewed up by all that sedimentary drilling mate you can just stick with the old boring diamond at rc nothing wrong with that no. nothing it's the foundation of k drill i'll just i'm just a bit scared k drill's going to get a bit bigger than their boots you know like just with this rapid expansion and growth <laughs> especially going into merchandise now. So, bloody uh, K-Drill. Thanks for the support. RC drilling. Experts. And just good people to talk to. You want to just cut? Q still hasn't met Ryan O'Sullivan. He didn't have the chance. No, he didn't have the chance. So, mate, you got people in West Perth restaurants that are keen to meet Ryan. So imagine if you're in the mining industry, you could meet him too. And Q's got a new shirt on the way as well. Give him a buzz. Now, JD, back. we can't get away from your little Cobra Panama Hot topic, because um, it is a bloody hot topic. It is. It's a big one. Newspaper article here about, uh, I think this is out yesterday, Cobre, uh, first quantum subsidiary requesting access to get on site to, regarding all the environmental, I guess, blockades that have been put in place. There is one person based here that I feel that First Quantum need to engage to come and save the day. They and should have engaged him four years ago. Well, he, he and he doesn't need to wear a cape because he's the ESG hero of the industry, Benny Swan. Have a look at him right there. <laughs> Do you f- not feel safer just looking at him? Do you not feel more environmentally friendly looking at Benny Swan? How could you not? How could you not? <laughs> Mate... <laughs> How do you fly to Panama from here? You'd have to go. That'd be a big trip. Do you reckon reckon Brooks fly direct (laughs) if they bloody in the old Learjet? You charter it. You can fly wherever you want. Long and the short, we need to get bloody Benny Swan chartered over to Panama ASAP to help save that operation. Yeah. I think if there's any bloke in the world that can do it that could really just take – just pull an ESG rabbit out of his hat – it's this guy. There's a direct link between, um, yeah, your, your sustainability credentials and uh, your market cap. And if, if someone can restore First Quantum's market cap. It's Ben Swan. It's Ben Swan. <laughs> so if you don't want to spend $10 billion US dollars on a mine yep. and then see that all disappear, call Ben Swan prior. What's the ROI on giving Ben Swan like, oh, I don't know, give him a buck or something? Uh, a phone call? Just – to save $10 billion, like talk about a margin, <laughs> like what an ROI. Yeah. And he, he probably wouldn't even take a buck, probably half a buck just for, you know, a couple of weeks' work. <laughs> but, uh, mate, save the day, Benny. Okay. Let's make a movement, get Benny Swan to Panama. Join, the right let's join some, let's um, get that 1.5% of the world's copper back into the market from for uh, Cobra Panama. Yep. I think it's Regis, Remelius. Grey uh, evolution. They all use Ben Swan. So mm. get your get 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 your stuff together. Use Ben Swan. Get your house in order. Get Benny Swan. Future, Future proof. proof. Love your bloody work. Right, boys. Let's yeah. go. Uh, 
Let's go save the day with some bloody petroleum chat. Oil and gas. Santos Woodside. Let's get into it. Right, Righto, welcome to our bloody... We've dragged a bloody oil and gas expert off the street of West Perth. <laughs> when you say oh. the street, you mean from our live event on Thursday. Yeah, yeah. And you've, you've teed up. o'clock. I'm like, oh, Tomo, you want to come in and talk about the bloody Woodside Santos deal? Yeah, <laughs> no worries, buddy. And here we are. There's Networking. two ways, Matty. Uh, identify guests. One is when he's drunk. The other one is at the front of the bar me place. They're, they're the two places for, for guest <laughs> identification. Meet me at either place if you want to come on. <laughs> Thompson, welcome. Or, or well, drunk at the front of the bar me store. The ultimate source <laughs> of alpha. How are you, Connor? Yeah, thanks for having me, guys. Here, yeah, really good. Thank you. I'm um, pretty excited to be here to talk about the, the big potential merger between Woodside and Santos. And well, we're going to do – this could be a teaser to a big uh, oil and gas spectacular for 2024, but uh, – because we wouldn't be able to do it justice in 20, 20 minutes, that whole market. But we're going to go into a bit of it today. And because uh, it was announced early last week, I guess, that what the data room's open for Santos and Woodside potentially merging, potentially being the key word. Tom, are you going to give us the, the rundown of the lay of the land? Yeah. What this merger might look like. And we're going to talk a bit of other oil and gas store stuff as well. So, but most of all, give us the tools to understand oil and gas because we have a mining show and we're, we're keen to. Thompson you know, is the tool, mate. <laughs> he's the tool for this purpose. You're not a tool, but you're, you're a bloody good bloke, if I say so myself. Um, but yeah, how, how are we going to start? So, first up, Woodside Santos. Uh, more so, let's step back a bit from that. The lay, of the lay of the land for Australian oil and gas. We hear about the Perth Basin, we hear about the Cooper Basin, Bass Strait, all that. What's it look like, Cobber? Yeah, mate. So uh, basically in Australia, Santos and Woodside are the big two in terms of the Australian-based companies. There's a, there's so they're your BHP and Rio of oil and gas pretty in much, Australia. Yeah, the other big players are your Chevrons and Exxons and Shells who are, who are based overseas. But the clear number one and two is Woodside and Santos. So this – Merger, if it were to go forward, you know, you're looking at an $80 billion combined entity um, to be one of the world's largest LNG suppliers. I mean, $80 billion far out. Mm. Yeah. So, so what are they sitting at? Who's, what's their relative market caps at the moment? So you've got Santos at about $22 to $24 billion and Woodside at around $60 billion. Um, so, you know, clearly Woodside's the, the larger entity and, you know, it would be pretty interesting to see how, how this would work, whether it's a – a true merger of equals. I think it was, it was 2021 that Woodside, they picked up all of BHP's uh, oil and gas assets in that um, pretty, yeah, pretty big yeah. deal at the time, which left um, BHP without its bloody oil and gas anymore and um, ended up with just the one listing on the Australian Stock Exchange instead of that weird dual listing structure. And Woodside gained a shitload of in, – in, a lot of them were crappy assets too, weren't they? Yeah, uh, the, the BHP portfolio – I think most people were saying the winner was Woodside. Yes. When, um, oh, the, when, when the they winner, they, they got, I mean, yeah, it was yeah. very low multiple, but um, yep. but some of those like, you know, the the offshore, you know, assets were maybe late life and Yep, definitely. Right? The, the, in terms of Australia, the Bass Strait asset yes. is the tricky one. Yep. Um, now that supplies a lot of the East Coast domestic gas supply, but what there is is there's a, there's a decommissioning overhang. You know, eventually – um, now Woodside and Exxon, we're going to have to decommission those assets. They're very old, big legacy assets. So there is some expenditure to come to to deal with those at some point in time. So is that, is that translates to their mining equivalents of a rehabilitation liability? Exactly right. So they'll have yeah. a big liability um, to effectively decommission and rehabilitate those offshore conditions. And, um, and it's rough seas there, so it's ex it's expensive and it's going to take a long time to, to, to fully rehabilitate that area. Yeah. And Santos did a, a pretty big deal of their their own with oil search not too long ago as well. So That's right. They um, Oil search was struggling in terms of share price and Santos were pretty quick to move. Um, the two key assets they picked up there was they, they increased their – their ownership um, in, in Papua New Guinea, in the PNG LNG assets. Which and is also a cash cow, up, that one, isn't it? Yeah, it's an yeah. absolute cash cow. A lot of people love those assets. Um, you know, I think in terms of Santos's portfolio, PNG is probably the, the shining the shining light there, and, is, and that's probably what Woodside's looking at mm. um, and in particular. A, was there a development project that Oil Search had in the Arctic as well? Was that Picker? That's right, yeah. It's called the Picker asset. It is um, it is in the Arctic Circle, Um some people love the asset. Some people don't like it so much. I mean, my look at it, it, it makes decent cash. Um, the, the challenge there is you're in the Arctic Circle um, and the, where the world's going now in terms of 
climate concerns and and dealing in sensitive environments, there are some question marks on on those assets from that perspective. So I guess with the what are the flagship assets in Australia, and then obviously which one of those are in either Santos's or Woodside's portfolios? Yeah, so these guys between them have pretty much an equity in, in every flagship asset. So you've got in the Northwest Shelf here, you've got the Northwest Shelf assets themselves, which Woodside operates. You've got Pluto, which Woodside owns and operates. Then you you shift up further up north. You've got um, the Darwin LNG asset, which um, Santos operates. So that had the Bayou Undan uh, gas coming into it and soon the Barossa will come in. And that's subject to a few um, pieces of litigation getting sorted out. Keep going over east. So Santos own and op- own a majority and, and operate the uh, Gladstone LNG, GLNG project there. Um, and as well as that, they've got um, a series of assets in the Cooper Basin and that's mostly domestic. Where's and the Cooper Basin again? Pretty much smack bang in the middle of Australia. So mm-hmm. primarily in South yeah. Australia, but it yeah. does go oh, okay. into yep. some of the other states there. Um, and then going further south, you've got um, – the Woodside equity in, in the Bass Strait assets, mm. which, which they have with Chevron. Oh, sorry, with Exxon. Is it no, fair to say a, both? That's a, between Victoria and Tassie, where they do the yes. yep. bloody yeah, Sydney and Hobart. Right. Yeah, that's, that's correct. Is it fair to say both sides. Bass Strait and Cooper Basin are sort of late life assets at this stage with a lot more kind of overhang from the rehab obligations or the Dino obligations? Yeah, very yeah. much so. They're, they're old assets. They, I mean, that those two basins are kind of Australia's original oil and gas basins. That's where everything started in this country. Um, and as a result, you know, they're starting to run out of reserves. Um, so, you know, really they're kind of drilling to keep things going and inevitably the the flood of having to deal with decommissioning will come. Yeah. So, so what about the Perth Basin? Are they in, in there at all? So um, when we talk about Perth Basin, that's where we hear about Strike, yep. Warrego, where Minres are. Wait till you it, it so took really? him four minutes to talk about mining companies. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So <laughs> yeah. are, they, are they in that – is that an emerging area that they're not a part of? Yeah, moving to the Perth Basin, I mean, that's probably a pretty interesting area for money miners given given a lot of that gas goes to support the mining industry here. Um, no, these guys do not have any equity exposure to the Perth Basin. So they're kind of everywhere in Australia, but the Perth Basin is is one spot that they've they've not been – they kind of didn't join the uh, the M and A part party mm. that was going on last year, so they they kind of sat out in the sidelines, mm. and um, yeah, we're we're here in a spot where um you know companies like Beach, Mitsui, um you know Hancock Prospecting got involved, Minres are involved in the Perth Basin, and and the kind of the last company that's not the big one is Strike Energy, um, they're all in there, they're yeah. all the dominant players, but no, at the moment, no Santos Woodside. Yeah, and what about so Scarborough is a big uh, development asset in Woodside's portfolio. Where, like, where do you geographically position that, and, and how, how much of a big deal is Scarborough? Scarborough, Scarborough is it's it's the resources offshore Australia, and what's going to happen there is they're going to tie that, and they have to bring that onshore to liquefy it. Yeah, um, it's a, it's very dry gas, so there's not much condensate there. Now, condensate's often important for these offshore developments because it's it's, it's a really high quality commodity, and it improves your cash flows. Um, so you basically strip out the condensate and you almost sell it as oil, but it's a dry gas. And what they'll do there is they'll bring that back to the, the Pluto plant where they're actually um, expanding and building a Pluto 2 train. So that's um, that's that's Woodside's kind of main growth asset in Australia at this time. Talk to us a bit about like what would the You'll rationale- get in there eventually, JD. He's like an I need to speak louder. Right? Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> you go, JD. <laughs> <laughs> well, I wanted to get into uh, the the investment bankers' favourite topics, and that's synergies. So I'm sure there's lots of bankers out there licking their Pardon lips. Pardon the pun. Mm. Synergy. <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> Top of the shelf, mate. <laughs> I'm sure there's a bunch of bankers out there just licking their lips because we're talking about, you know, a merger, there's fees involved, and then potentially spinning out assets to sort of comply with, you know, a C regulation potentially down the track. So... How do, how do you view the synergies? I've heard some people say there's hardly any between the two parties here. I've heard some put a figure of 150 to 300 million between, which is, you know. Still not much. On the scale of. That's what, corporate what, MPV, mate. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. On the scale of a $80 million sort of yeah. giant yeah. after this. 80 it's, billion. It's yeah. 80 billion. Yeah, big yeah. bucks. Yeah, it's pretty interesting. There's, a, there's probably a few things to touch on here. I mean, the, f- the first one is that they will grow to scale. You know, you're talking an $80 billion business, it will be one of the world's largest LNG suppliers. Now, what that means for these guys is they can probably become more prominent in 
in supplying LNG and trading LNG. And if you look at groups like Shell, particularly um, during the COVID times, sometimes the trading division made more money than the upstream division. So when you combine yeah. these assets, you've got you've got exposure to as a combination more LNG trains, more to, more locations from where LNG will come from. They will have the ability to to move cargo, shift cargoes. Um, they're bigger now, so they can probably expose more um, more of their um, reserves to the spot market, for example, rather than having to pre-sell everything. So from a trading perspective, there is the potential for kind of synergies and, and basic, you know, extra, extra margin on, on your, on your resource that you're selling. What is interesting though, is they, they do, if this merger happens, the combined entity will control so much of Australian domestic gas. So there will be, Can I? well, that's going to be the question I'm guessing. And a lot of people are saying the ACCC will be looking at this pretty closely. Um, so what does that mean? Does that mean they have to maybe spin out or sell some of the domestic gas assets in the portfolio, that's going to be something for everyone to have to watch. And you can bet all the bankers and lawyers are sitting in the room if they're going through the, the process right now, trying to trying to work that out. So if they spin it out, but Woodside and Santos maintain some ownership in the spin out, is that does that fix that ACCC issue or yeah, not? You'd have to sell down your, your interest so you in, in the it. spin yeah. out. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> particularly in the East Coast where gas prices are really high and I think the problem could happen here one day as well, the last thing the ACCC wants is less parties controlling the gas. You know, the, the argument is we should have more more people controlling gas and, and creating a more competitive environment for, for gas. So I don't even think you could spin out the joint domestic gas assets as one asset. It has to maybe just be some individual sales or there's gonna, they're going to have to come up with a very creative solution to, to deal with the concerns of the ACCC. Tommy, you mentioned the, the um, East Coast gas market there. And I think like for money miners, it'd be, it'd be useful to just get the big picture overview of like, how is the West Coast gas market different to the East Coast gas market, which typically has a higher you know, per uh, GJ price? Yeah. So, I mean- Good lingo, Trav. On, on, the, on, the, East, it, on the East Coast, <laughs> their, uh, their energy market's all linked, right? So they can pretty much move electricity around- um, and then we have, we have a completely separate system here, which is the Swiss system, and as well as the, the miners have a lot of their own kind of capability to produce energy as well. So we, we are a completely independent market to the East Coast. The challenge they have on the East Coast is, you know, particularly Victoria and New South Wales have not been friendly jurisdictions to invest in, in new oil and gas. So, um, what's happened in Queensland is, you know, with the, with the LNG plants there, we're exporting a lot of it as a country. And those are on long-term export contracts. When they built those plants, you know, you're talking that signing off takes for like 20 years. So that 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 gas has been sold. Mm. So you you know, and with the uh, the coal industry slowing down and being shut down there, what you're seeing is really people a flight to buying more gas. And so the spot market, for example, gas gas can be over fifteen dollars a gigajoule in the East Coast. And you know, there's talk of it being higher at times. And it's six bucks in WA at the moment. Is yeah, that I right? think the last time I checked the spot market here is about six dollars. You might get yeah. little spikes from time to time. And a couple of years ago, you know, it was three or four dollars in, in WA. So we do have cheap gas here, which keeps our power prices prices down. I mean you're looking at kind of your, your processing and, and what the miners need, it makes their cost of, it kind of manages their cost of production. Now, the, the, now, fifteen dollar gas price is very problematic for industry on the east coast. Mm. Um, it, it's expensive gas, and it, is that a function of what you said before? The fact that it hasn't been friendly for new oil and gas to get up and going. Yeah, it's simply not enough supply coming on. You mm. know, and a lot of the supply that is being produced is mandated to be exported via the existing offtake agreement. Okay, yeah. yeah, yeah. So there's probably a bit of gas to be had there, and, and the, the big one, which is actually in Santos portfolio, is the Narrabri asset. So that's the um, the continuation of the, the big coal seam coal seams in Queensland coming into New South Wales. Now that's been caught in a bunch of green and red tape. Um, if Santos could get that online, that could probably plug a lot of issues on the east coast. But it, it's it's a political matter. It's it, there's a lot happening there that's kind of stopping that from coming online. I wonder if Woodside could take a view that permitting would be easier if it was under their portfolio. <laughs> yeah, I mean. Once again, it's another one they've got to come up with a solution. Maybe that one has to be an asset that does not sit in the combined entity. Um, but who who really – the question is who really will have the, the kind of license to operate that? Yeah. So <clears throat> the way you pitch the, the, the transaction going ahead there between Santos and Woodside is 
you know, really speaking to economies of scale. And we've seen similar transactions in America, two almost $100 billion in Aussie dollar term transactions by Chevron and Exxon, both just in the in the past couple months. The, the way the advisors and the bankers over there have framed that is multiples and the, you know, the ultimate outcome being a high multiple for a business with more economies of scale. I've got a, a sort of two-part question. Is that how you'd anticipate the, the bankers and the like uh, marketing the deal here? And perhaps an intro to that, how do oil and gas stocks tend to trade on a multiples basis in, in Australia versus the likes of America? Yeah, so the, the multiples question's a, a very interesting one for oil and gas. Um, I mean, you guys have covered this a bit for the, for the, the mining stocks. Is it's probably not necessarily the best way to value it. I mean, every, every asset's different, particularly if you've got assets that have um, big abandonment and decommissioning liabilities co- coming up. But, you know, uh, for the most part, you know, some of the guys that have stayed focused, like your Exxons and Chevrons, I think they're trading at, at multiples of about six, six times earnings. Um the oil and gas guys are, are trading less than that. I mean, I haven't checked recently, but I'm, I'm guessing it's probably like a three or four multiple. Mm. Um, so mm. there is there is a clear discount between um, the Aussie and the US guys, and maybe combining now as an eighty million dollar eighty billion dollar company. Sorry, maybe portfolio managers around the world have to own the stock now when it's when it's you know the, one of the biggest LNG suppliers in the world, and, and maybe in theory it could it could come up to to those US style multiples. And you'd anticipate that. Given we're talking about a merger without a premium or maybe like a 5% premium or something, that is what Woodside would kind of have to pitch to Santos to try and get the deal over the line saying, hey, we're going to get these economies of scale. We're going to trade at a better multiple because we're not going to give you a a 30% premium. Yeah, it's an interesting story, the premium. I mean, if you look at what the market's done, Santos has run about 5% since, since that announcement. Um, Woodside have pretty much traded sideways, gone up a, a little tick just with the oil price on over the weekend. So is that suggesting maybe a really small margin? I would think so. I, I personally can't see Woodside paying you kind of 30, 40% premium on, yep. on, on, on the acquisition. Um, so, I mean, what does this mean? Do, does this mean it's going to be kind of a, a close to nil premium merger? Um, how do Santos shareholders feel about this, given they were trading at, you know, $7, uh, you know, maybe highs at $8 in, um, earlier in the year, and now they're trading at about $7.30. Yeah, they're you, both close to sort of 12 times one. lows, aren't they? That's right. And and Woodside, I think, are trading around $30 today. Um, that, yeah. That's big time lows. So was that – was the incentive for announcing this – to try and get something happening in each of their share prices. I think they'd, they'd say that neither of them announced that it. it was leaked. And I mean, like, data, you know, data rooms weren't even prepared at the time. It was kind of leaked, but um, yeah, it is interesting. And I, I think like, you know, on the premium front, like Woodside have precedent for just, you know, the portfolio getting bigger at these depressed sort of multiples. And that was the BHP merger. Like, you know, it was a, a, a kind of COVID impacted deal where oil and gas assets trading on de minimis multiples. And, and, and again, you kind of got that kind of same dynamic where these assets are trading really, really low multiples, but there's good reason to think that you have a structurally high, you know, um, energy market for a long time as a result of some of these disconnects we're observing. What, what about the assets in terms of the life left in them across the both the Santos and Woodside portfolios? From what I've heard, some of the Santos assets are running out of gas um, and, do they become a lot more expensive to operate when they are running out of gas because gas, they haven't got the flow coming out? Yeah, um, they do have pretty broad portfolios, but from a Santos perspective, some of their domestic gas assets in WA are coming to the end of end of their life. Um, the talk is that the Queensland assets aren't always producing at, at, at peak capacity. Yep. Um, once again, Narrabri would help solve that. Bay Udan has come off. Um, that I think they shipped their last LNG cargo sometime within the last two weeks. Where's that one? They are that's um, that's technically in the, in Timor Leste, East Timor, but it's piped oh, right. to Darwin. Um, and what they're looking to do there, and, the, and they they had started drilling and developing the um, the Barossa project, and that was going to be the the backfill gas for for Darwin LNG. Um, and then and then they're looking at PNG expansion. So they do have some growth, and they've got they've got the Dorado asset, for example, it's an oil asset here in Western Australia as well. So. They do have a lot of growth in their portfolio. Actually, Woodside have some growth as well. But at the same time, they do have those – all of them have abandonment liabilities coming up. 
So has it, has it been in the pipeline or talked about for a while that this merger could or should happen? Has there been the, a bit of, what would you say, a bit of word in the well? Yeah. <laughs> or, 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 <laughs> word on the rig. rig. Word um, on the rig. Word on the yeah. rig. But you, a few years ago, these rumours were around. Absolutely. They were there. But what, what then happened was um, the Woodside deal did the deal buying the BHP assets. Santos did the deal buying the oil, buying oil, oil search out. And that kind of made those rumours go away. Um, so I think Santos actually went first. So they were going to be, after the oil search merger, the biggest oil and gas company in Australia. And then I think it was within days or weeks, um, Woodside did the B- made the BHP announcement. Um, so they've really been focusing on integrating th- those assets into their portfolios. Um, but yes, there has been whispers over the last few months that these guys have been have been talking. And obviously it sounds like enough had leaked, so they... Um, they got. They had to make comment, and yeah, uh, n- yeah. neither of them chose to d- decline or, or deny the rumor. So, that, you know, they're they're facing the music now. Um, do you think it's going to happen from a bystander's point of view? Good question. Uh, personally, I see a fair bit of risk, particularly with the A Triple C um, and what, how they'll how they'll view it. Unless these guys have come up with a, a very elegant solution. Um, you know, they'll definitely have the best bankers and lawyers looking at this and, and coming up with solutions. So so there's a maybe. My, my, my question is, as a shareholder from each company, is this the best deal? You know, are you better off getting someone bigger, you know, one of the big US or European players to come and take take Woodside or Santos out? And, and for cash. For whereas, cash. Because this will be no doubt a scheme of arrangement Correct. of some so you, sort. I'm thinking cash, 20, 30% um, premium, those – that seems more attractive to me as a shareholder than kind of this merger. There's a lot of things about the merger that might not make sense. Mm. Mm. Capital gains roll over relief though. Ooh, that's what I want. <laughs> mm. uh, I, I got I got sort of you know a couple more angles I just want to cover with you while we got your time. And one is just um, the the interest in these gas assets from the um, the mining magnates. I mean, we had the M and A sort of bidding ish war which was their cooperation, was there not? I'm not sure. Um, between uh, Chris and Gina earlier in the year and that kind of, you know, was the, was, was the beginning of a, an ongoing discussion about those two entities and in, in lithium later on. But what, you know, Gina, she's had some interest in gas for a while. She, in a JV with, with POSCO, acquired Cenex, I think 2021 or tw- no, 2022. Er, early 22. Yeah. So, and then, and then obviously um, later uh, the, the, the Warrigo, uh, like like M and A battle that that eventuated there. What's Gina's ambition? What's Chris's ambition? How do you how do you evaluate that? Can't get away from these two, can we? Yeah, no, they're everywhere. Bloody it, everything. Yeah, Thursday night at the pub, they're everywhere. <laughs> must must have been that bloody Sunday tea party that I was discussing been. gas <laughs> one weekend. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty interesting. I mean, I think in fairness to both of them, they they do their research and th- there's a lot of hype and hysteria and about the oil industry in this country, but. I think they know how critical particularly gas is, is to Australia's future. Um, so, you know, the first moves were made by Hancock Prospecting over, over Eastern and they secured Cenex. And last year, pretty close to Christmas, was was a bit of um, musical chairs in, in WA where I think Beach lobbed the first bid. I can't remember if it was Beach or Strike lobbed the first bid anyways on um, on Warrigo. And, um, but ultimately Hancock Prospecting, took out Warrigo and, and completed the takeover. So they are now in the Perth Basin. Um, Minres, uh, you know, they, they kind of quietly got into the Perth Basin a while back, um, but they they shared an asset called where they drilled Lockyer Deep um, together with Norwest. Um, and and that, that had some su- a big success initially. You know, the, the talk was that was over a trillion cubic foot of gas, which is a lot of gas. Um, the second well was not so successful. But they're in there. They're, they're something there. Um, they're both keen. And for me, it's why do they want to do it? Well, it, it's actually pretty simple. All of the mines here use a lot of gas for, for um, to, to supply energy to their to their operations. To get rid of diesel. That's the to get rid of diesel. Yeah. But they've yeah. got they've got big plants on um, mm. on site to do all the things that you need to do on site. And I think the concern they have is the gas price is going to go up in WA over the next 10, 10 or so years. So why not? own the gas yourself so that you're kind of managing managing your cost exposure and it's effectively a physical hedge. Is it, is it you're predicting it to go up based on more use on mine sites and domestic supply? Yeah, there's a couple of key um, domestic supplies coming off. So the, the reindeer field, which is 
owned and operated by Santos, um, and that this is public. I th- you know, it, it's either finished producing or it's very close to finish. There's a couple of other critical assets which are coming towards the end of their life. Um, you know, the Northwest Shelf Joint Ventures, domestic production is going to come down. Now, while Pluto's coming on um, and you've still got the Chevron assets supplying the market, we really need more. And, and the Perth Basin is, is that answer. You know, the, 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 just the Perth Basin as a, as a new gas province only got reinvigorated within the last five years. Um, and it's very critical to the mining industry. So, you know, if, if, you, if you're these guys and you can buy and own the gas for, say, one or two dollars per gigajoule, that's great because if you're, I think if you're in 2030 and you're trying to buy this gas spot, you're paying maybe $10 gigajoule or more. I think the interesting thing with Gina, by the way, is like, so if she went in that JV with POSCO to buy Senex, that's Queen, that's Queensland gas. So it's, it's more than just, it must be more than just wanting to own the gas that's going to feed her mining uh, operations given, you know, I can't, what, what are the synergies with the, with the Senex stuff, right? Um, yeah. The, I mean, that, that's a slightly different story because they can't, necessarily export a lot of the gas yeah. that um, Senex has. Um, I mean, that was probably just the value play from my perspective. Gotcha. Yeah. And and the last thing is just in, in Western Australia, there's just, you know, I remember looking at the, reading the MinRes AGM presentation this year and this slide where uh, MinRes is clearly, you know, lobbying the government to um, remove the WA DOM gas requirement. Trav, I've got a quote for you. MinRes, this is by Mr. Ellison, MinRes yeah. would not build a large-scale gas plant in the Perth Basin unless the WA government ditched restrictions on the export of gas from onshore projects. <laughs> so, so A, what is what is this DOM gas requirement thing that needs to be ditched and B, what impact would it have on the West Australian gas market if, if, it, if it was ditched? Yeah, so... It's kind of got to be divided into, into two parts. All the offshore gas, if you bring any of it onshore to be processed into LNG, you you must supply 15% of that into the domestic market. Mm-hmm. Now, as it is offshore, um, and the legislation got updated quite recently, the um, the government actually has, the state government has banned the export of anything produced in the, in the Perth Basin. So why, why that's challenging is if you want to build a large domestic gas plant, A, it's going to cost you a lot of money. So what you would like, and, and, and so A, it's going to cost you lots of money and, and B, you need long-term offtake to, to justify, you know, spending half a billion dollars or more. Yeah. So what you want to do is if you, if you can tap um, LNG markets and be exposed to LNG pricing, which you can earn, you can get earn greater revenues per gigajoule of gas. What, what, what sort of difference are we talking about if you can sell it, you know, JKM or whatever? Yeah, so, I mean, I, I was just looking at futures for JKM. You, you're talking through the rest of winter, 12 to $13 effectively per gigajoule, that and Aussie? that's US dollars. US, okay, right. so that's a big difference between six bucks Aussie. Correct. Yeah. 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 So, I mean, you've obviously got to pay the price of liquefying it. Yeah. And then you yeah. then your margins are – but your margins are higher. So, you, you know, if you want to build, say, half a billion dollars or a billion dollar gas plant here – you need access to that sort of revenue. Yeah. Uh, you can probably secure longer term offtakes. And also if you're building a half a billion dollar plant, you're probably talking about, you know, that's probably going to supply a quarter of WA's gas. So are you going to oversupply the local market mm-hmm. by actually building one of them? So it, it is a balance between allocating enough for export and enough for, for the domestic users. Mm. So if if that requirement was eliminated, then you could, you could finance it, you could attract et cetera. But do you think there's some impact that, you know, you would, you would see higher gas prices in Western Australia as a result of it as well, because you, you would see a greater proportion of existing plants, um, exporting more as opposed to. Yeah, potentially. I mean, on one hand, it's going to incentivize people building, drilling more and actually building the plants, knowing that they, their projects can effectively be, become more bankable. Um, so that's the, you know, the pro export argument. Let's, you know, let's, let's get access to that capital and improve the bankability of these, these things. The risk is that too much is allocated to export and there's not enough certainty on, you know, do, do domestic um, users get looked after before mm. your, your, exp- your export market? What uh, would it mean are there for, other for price mine? caps and those sorts of things? And yeah. what, no, no one likes that kind of um, government intervention. But what would it mean for mine profitability if, if um, WA gas was like 12 bucks per gigajoule instead of... Instead of six. <laughs> well, it's, it's obviously increasing their cost, right? So yeah. it, it increases your OPEX. Um, and I mean, I think the view, particularly where, where we want to go and start value adding our commodities here, the, the work required to value add is very energy intensive. So if we want to start, you know, putting 
more refineries, et cetera, in, in Western Australia. We need cheap gas to make that happen. And I think that's where the state's going to probably think, okay, let's let's limit these exports to be to enable that, that, that part of industry in, in, in WA. Beautiful. 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 Cheers, Good mate, for a good cameo, Tom. I bloody much appreciate it. You, when you come on Money or More, mate, you get given a nickname straight away. <laughs> Has Tomo been a thing? It just seems like the yep. logical way to do it. Tomo works. Tomo works. Beautiful. Mate, Thanks for coming by, Tomo. you resident oil and gas expert. So. <laughs> Thanks for having me, guys. Mate, Thank you very much, mate. Thanks, and bloody Merry Christmas to you, mate, because uh, <laughs> we're heading up to the, the festive season. We've got to start wishing everyone Merry Christmas now. Yeah. Money of mine and oil and gas. <laughs> <laughs> money. Well, how would you? What would you call it? Money of oil resources. Money of gas. <laughs> kind of um, like money of mine. <laughs> no, no. Like if we do an offshoot, like when it goes massive, <sighs> so the spin out, like Santos and Woodside. <laughs> no I'll come back. I'll come back to you with that. I'll one. stop <laughs> talking. Right, Tom. Hey, good work, Tom. Cheers, Cheers, mate. Boys. Cheers, Thank Tom. You. Merry Christmas. Right, hey, boys. Bloody sensational stuff. I knew we'd get a full episode out of that. <laughs> we're just like, oh, we'll just do 10 or 15 minutes. Nah. I'd never put it past you, man. Why waste the bloody valuable opportunity with Big Thompson in the building? It was a good. It was a bit of a 101 for us, not so well-versed in the in the energy world, but it was great to chat about what's going on in WA, why the, the east and west coast differs, and, of course, the, the mega merger. Mm, well, mate, if I'm learning a lot and I'm bloody interested in it, the money miners will too, the ones that are on my level <laughs> like Trav's level bro they might buddy yeah anyway I'm just I'm comfortable down here you wait mate I'm, I'm fine this time next year you'll be a petroleum guru I as JD said I am the one of the few people that rings up brokers and tells them what I'm buying <laughs> You're that knowledgeable, mate. <laughs> just, that is how we bloody roll mate Thompson's actually looking for a gig too CFO job if you got a CFO gig you it what a what a CV we've just put out for him. Yep. He's come and demonstrated his knowledge of the oil and gas market. Good bloke, but he hit him up. Least we could do for him. Good favour he did. All for across us. the uh, the natural resource well, spectrum as that's well. That's funny. We're like, what gig do you want, mate? He's like, yeah, I wouldn't mind some hard rock mining CFO gigs after yeah. <laughs> after that oil and gas knowledge he just oh. bloody. If he just <laughs> if he just wants a little like intermediary job in oil and gas just while he finds that hard rock oh, job piece of, piece of piss mate doesn't matter you can translate that skills and knowledge anywhere with a guy like that love your work thanks to all the bloody legends money are we got i think we get rid of partners sponsors that term it's just money of mine legend <laughs> who, we, who we got i've got to rattle them off without bloody i've got to get good at rattling them off by themselves KCA site services, because last time I rattled it off, I bloody forgot them, so I'll get them out of the road. Yep. DSI Underground, Investor Hub, K Drill, Future Proof Consulting, Brooks Airways, MMTS. MMTS, the title management gurus. Anytime exploration. Anytime exploration. And K Drill. And our other OG, Terra Capital. Love your bloody work. Hooteroo. Hooteroo, money miners. The information contained in this episode of Money of Mine is of general nature only and does not take into account the objectives, financial situation or needs of any particular person. Before making any investment decision, you should consult with your financial advisor and consider how appropriate the advice is to your objectives, financial situation and needs.